Welcome to today's Zerospine webcast, streaming live from our headquarter here in Germany. For all of you who already joined some of our webcasts, there's a new face today in front of the camera. My name is Jochen Breuer-Steinbach. I'm the marketing manager of Zerospine and I'm really excited to be here today. The topic of today's cast is full endoscopic lumbar decompression. We are so excited about the feedback we got from our last casts and the huge interest you showed us. So it's a really, really good time for you to show our possibilities about the technique and our international network for full endoscopic spine surgery. Many thanks for that and I hope you will enjoy this webcast today too. We will never stop support spine surgeons in Europe in the USA, Asia, South America, all, all over the world, who are wants to know more about full endoscopic spine surgery. Therefore, it's a great honor that today Dr. Martin Komp from St. Anna Hospital in Herner is with us uh, for doing the lecture and the presentations. You know maybe St. Anna Hospital Herner is one of the major and pioneering hospitals in Germany in, and worldwide we're doing a lot of full endoscopic cases every day. So uh, please enjoy the lecture of full endoscopic lumbar decompression and we will have a live discussion with Dr. Martin Komp and Dr. Ruhl Koklu after presentations. So whenever you have questions regarding today's topic, please use the chat function of the YouTube so you can uh, write everything you want and we will co come back to you to the questions later on with Dr. Martin Komp live and Dr. Ryuri Koklu uh, for discussion and uh, all the questions you have regarding full endoscopic spine surgery. We hope you enjoyed this today's webcast and we are looking forward for the next casts who are already scheduled and planned. So we'll, ha we'll have more and more activities uh, global and for special regions. So please uh, use the possibility wherever you are to follow one of our webcasts, go to our website, go to our YouTube channel, follow us at social media, so you will get a lot of information regarding full endoscopic spine surgery, and we keep you updated about the upcoming casts and events we plan for the next month. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Dear colleagues, my talk will be about the concept of full endoscopic lumbar decompression. That is also an overview about our own history and developments of the last 20 years. So we will talk about this full endoscopic treatment only of the lumbar spine because other options are also there. That means we can do uh, decompression in other parts of the spine too. But I will focus in this lecture about the lumbar spine. When we look at the data, we see that there is a growing demand on operations at the spine, especially um, decompression for herniational stenosis. In Germany, um, these spine surgeries are uh, similar to knee replacement or appendectomy. So this is a growing numbers of patients we are talking about. We all know the symptoms of herniation and stenosis especially when we're talking about lumbar disconnections, we are talking about radicular symptoms. And we also know that local symptoms, especially back pain, is uh, mainly due to the degeneration itself. And it cannot be promised that we can um, make these uh, symptoms better for the patient when we do a decompression. Of course, we often offer our patient a conservative treatment. And in most of these cases, for the first weeks, the conservative treatment is sufficient. But when we look at literature, we see that the evidence for this non-operative care is low. Though we are offering these our patients, um, and in a lot of cases we have um, success. But we have surgical indications, absolute and relative indications. But whenever we have to prove the surgical indication, 
we have to have a matching of findings and symptoms for these patients. When we stick to these indication criteria, we see in literature that we have a clear benefit with a surgical procedure versus a non-operative treatment. But we also see that we have problems with surgical procedures and we know that for decades in spinal surgery these are problems related to um, the approach itself but also other problems may, that may be occurred to um, that may occur after surgery and uh, these problems were the reason why surgeons try to um, um, do more minimal invasive surgery to reduce the problems and its consequences. So there was a big um, change in spine surgery in the last decades from the conventional techniques to the more minimal invasive techniques like the introduction of the microscopic assisted surgery in the 80s. And also in the literature it was proven that these minimal invasive techniques can reduce traumatization of the tissue and its consequences. When we look at the microscopic assisted technique, this is a less invasive technique with a very good illumination and a good intraoperative view. When we started in 1999 with endoscopic treatment of uh, pathologies at the spine, we started with uh, epiduroscopy. This is a flexible fiber endoscope which is inserted in the head of sacralis and has an intraendoscopic working channel of one millimeter. But you see on the left side the uh, optical quality due to the fiber optic system was bad and the mechanical possibilities that we had um, due to the small working channel were very restricted. But then there were some um, doctors uh, throughout the world um, who were using a lens optic system with a postural lever approach and we saw um, the optical quality was much better than with the fiber optic system. So we try to combine the cannula system um, of the lens optic system with the fiber endoscope because we saw the optical quality was good but the postural lateral approach uh, was not uh, good to reach directly the ventral epidural space and we tried to combine the fiber scope um, with the cannula of the uh, lens optic system and it was possible now to reach the ventral epidural space but the um, bad um, optical quality and um, the small working channel, of course, with the restricted mechanical possibilities still remained. And that was the starting point for us to um, work with lens optic system, but to change the approach. We're talking about full endoscopic operation um, and we are orthopedic surgeons. That means uh, we, um, were coming from the joints uh, where we had a very good illumination, a very good visualization working under continuous irrigation, which makes it also possible to use different tools like laser or other uh, now radio frequency devi uh, devices. And uh, we um, defined the goals that we wanted to achieve. That means working uh, uh, under continuous irrigation, working with rod lens systems, uniportal approach, and we wanted to create a real alternative to conventional techniques. And the um, full endoscopic operation means we wanted to work under continuous visual control, under continuous irrigation, and this is not an um, endoscopic assisted pr uh, procedure where we introduce uh, a tubular retractor and a uh, endoscope beside, but it's a uniportal technique using an endoscope with an intraendoscopic working channel. So throughout the years, together with uh, Richard Wolf and now Revo Spine, we developed all the kinds of tactical stuff, endoscopes, instruments, um, that makes it possible now to work uh, very effective um, for all kinds of decompression in all parts of the spine. So we have these full endoscopic techniques mainly for decompression, not only at the lumbar spine,
but also at the thoracic and cervical spine. So let's have a closer look to the lumbar spine. Let's first have a look for disc herniations. We are talking about radicular symptoms when we are talking about an indication for a decompression due to a herniation at the lumbar spine. We have two approaches, that's the transfer extraframal approach um, and the interlaminar approach. I'm talking about that later. When we're talking about the transfer extraframal approach, it is important that we are talking about the lateral approach. Why do we use a lateral approach? Well, the facet is a kind of hypermochilion. It pushes the sleeve to the lateral anterior part of the spine. That means our working area goes into the disc. And with this postural lateral approach, we have a higher risk to damage the exiting nerve. So you see here a uh, picture of the postural lateral approach. It is normally measured by centimeters from the midline. In an angle of about 45 degrees, we go in with the endoscope and you see the working area which we can reach. It is easy to get to the foramen area, it is easy to get to the intervertebral space. But we wanted to visualize directly the pathology lying in the ventral epidural space. And therefore we had no possibility and that was the starting point to change this approach to the lateral aspect. So. We are now not longer measuring centimeters from the midline for uh, getting our starting point, but we are um, planning our approach at the specific anatomical landmarks of the patient. That means in the lateral CM position, we find the posterior line of the facets. We mark a first line here in the lateral CM position. Um, then we mark the middle of the intervertebral space in AP. Then we have a cross point at the skin, and that is our entry point for the skin incision for the placement of the needle and later on for the endoscope. And by doing that, we have an angle of about 20 to 25 degrees with the endoscope. We have the working channel now, not only in the foramen area, in the disc, but especially in the ventral epidural space. How far lateral we have to go is always a combination of the specific anatomical details of the patient. As more narrow the foramen is, as more the dimension of the herniation to the dorsal aspect is, and as more obese the patient is, as more lateral we have to go. And the goal is always to reach the anterior epidural space directly. The transframinal view is completely different to that, what we know from the commensural operation. That means we are looking um, with a 25 degree optical system from um, Anterior to posterior, we are looking below the neurostructures when we are working inside the spinal canal. So the transframer approach is a needle technique. After placing the needle, we insert a guide wire, and over this guide wire goes a dilator, and over this dilator goes the baveled operation sleeve. Our starting point is in the lateral CM position and the lower lumbar levels. Um, the uh, posterior line of the facets, cranial of L45 or at least L34, we choose the uh, tip of the spinous process. So then we change um, into AP and mark the middle of the interval of the space. And then we have a cross point at the skin and that is our entry point for the skin incision. When we introduce the needle, make yourself clear where are the anatomical structures located in the neuroframen. The exiting nerve root is leaving the neuroframe and the cranial part. So whenever you introduce your needle, stay caudal and posterior. Hit the bone of the facet, control um, the position of your needle in the other position of the C-arm and then correct the position of the needle um, until you find the uh, ideal position. When you introduce the needle, always stop at the medial pedicle line and control where you are in the lateral CM position. Ideal um, starting point is the medial pedicle line and the posterior part of the annulus. So after we place the dilator over the guide wire and um, the beveled operation cannula, we have the opening of the sleeve to the posterior aspect and we see three zones in the um, 
12 o'clock area, we see the entry to the aperture space, we see the uh, aperture fat, this horizontal fiber is the PLL, and the uh, beginning of the annulus, and below that we find the entrance to the disk space. So when you prepare those structures, um, use the radio frequency um, probe to uh, clean everything, rotate the endoscope a little bit, then you can see um, what your instruments um, is, uh, are doing. So uh, look in the mouth of the instruments that you're not blindly cutting in structures that you cannot identify. And then step by step we have to go to the medial aspect, find the herniation and resect the herniation. We also see that the epidural space is not mobile um, and that's always the situation that we have to uh, reach after the operation. The sign for sufficient decompression for the transframer approach is always the free floating of the structures after resection of the material. You use the endoscope um, by rotating the endoscope to reach every uh, part of the um, area, you know, the intradiscal area to remove um, loose fragments. And you see now the structures um, that are mobile, pulsating the posterior part of the annulus and, uh, and the PLL and the entry to the disk space. Another example, you see those three zones, um, 12 o'clock, the epidural space, then the horizontal fibers of the PLL and annulus, and then the disk space, rotate the endoscope to see what you're cutting. Go to the medial aspect to find the herniation. We see the herniation presses the structures to the dorsal aspect. This is the epidural space, and then the resection of the herniated material. And after resection of the herniated material, we see already the free floating structures. This is not the neurostructure, this is the PLL. It is not necessary to resect the PLL in all cases. Um, it is necessary to see the free floating structures. Now, when you resect now the PLL, be careful. Sometimes you have adhesions between the PLL. Now you see the dura there. Um, but for sufficient decompression, it is absolutely enough when you resect the herniation to see the um, elongated PLL and it uh, is floating. This is absolutely enough. Now we see again the decompressed new structures um, in the cranial part, um, the rest of the PLL and the entry to the disk space. Around 10% of the disk herniations are located in the intra extraframial area. When we want to do a conventional technique, we do a microscopic assisted technique with a paramedian approach. But you know that these approaches can be demanding. When we want to work in this area uh, with an endoscope, you may have heard about a safe zone, a triangular um, safe zone or Kambin triangle, which is described in the literature where you can place your needle safely. We always say there exists no safe zone, especially when you're not able to identify clearly the anatomical area. That means when you have a foramen or herniation or a um, narrowed foramen, you're not able to identify the exiting nerve clearly in the preoperative MRI. Um, then you have a quite high risk to damage the exiting nerve when you're doing a um, only radiographic guided approach. So in these cases, we are not doing a transframer approach because we have a higher risk to injure um, of the exiting nerve, um, but we are doing an extraframer approach. Extraframer approach means we are placing our needle not in the foramen, but we are placing our needle at the bony junction of the pedicle and ascending facet. That means cordally and dorsal in the um, foramen. And then um, everything goes there, the guide wire, um, the dilator, and the cannula. Of course, you have to make sure that your instruments stay in this position. And when you introduce the endoscope, then you prepare under continuous visualization everything, bony structures, disc, and um, the exiting rear foot. So we are doing a normal planning of our approach, lateral approach in uh, the lateral position and AP. 
And then we insert the needle to this bony junction. It is always a little bit helpful uh, to push the needle a little bit in the bone. The guide wire then stays uh, also in this area. Then you can introduce um, the dilator um, and start to work. So why should we do this with a lateral uh, approach when we are um, going for an intral exoframial herniation? Well, um, we can work underneath the exiting nerve root without squeezing the uh, nerve root. When we are using a posterior lateral approach, we have to mobilize um, the complete uh, exiting nerve root to the cranial aspect. That means we squeeze the exiting nerve root against the pedicle. After having done the approach, we start to prepare the foramen. That means first we prepare the bony structures or the ascending facets and the pedicle, then we find the disc, and then we can get access to the foramenal area or later on into the spinal canal if that is necessary in very narrowed foramen, for example, with an intraspinal located pathology, and we can find the exiting nerve root. 80% of the uh, herniations located in the frame are located um, uh, in the cranial part because that's the only way where they can go to. Um, so we have the possibility to work with the cannula as our second instrument to mobilize the exiting nerve root um, to the cranial aspect to work underneath the exiting nerve root and to resect the herniated material. Example for that. First of all, um, we start here at the pedicle, and that's the left side, that means right side is caudal, where we find the pedicle, left side is cranial. We see the pedicle at 3 o'clock and the ascending facet at 12 o'clock. So we use the cannula to see everything very well, make sure that your cannula stays in place. We find the uh, disc space. Um, be careful that you are not losing your contact when that happens. There comes the um, exiting nerve root. Make sure that you shift the cannula to the dorsal aspect, overgo the uh, nerve root, and then prepare further on to the cranial part of the foramen. So now here we are starting to work in the cranial part of the foramen. And um, then we find the exiting nerve root resection here of the material and in the cranial part we see the exiting nerve root. Now we can um, work underneath the exiting nerve root by uh, opening uh, opening the um, rangeur. So this is a very uh, distinguished technique to work in the um, intra and extra foramen area. Again this lifting of the exiting nerve root to get access below the exiting nerve root and um, we are not squeezing the exiting nerve root to the cranial pedicle. That's the way to the spinal canal. So exiting nerve root again just to show you the anatomy and the narrow anatomical conditions. If necessary you can even go to the uh, opposite side of the um, exiting nerve root. Sometimes you have really far lateral herniations which are lying um, cranial of the exiting nerve root, very far lateral in the disc. Another example, uh, first of all you see soft tissue and you feel the bone here. Again the left side, right side is caudal, left side is cranial. You see the junction of the pedicle and ascending facet which is directly in front of us. Then we find the disc space and then this space is now on the right side and we are going to the uh, following the ascending facet to the cranial aspect and we find the, ex, uh, the, the extruded material here. Um, first preparation, you know, we can lift the um, L4 nerve roots, search for um, more um, material here, reject the material which is going um, to the area of the axilla. That's already the epidural fat of the um, neurostructures here inside the spinal canal. So you have quite a good uh, 
possibility to resect those cranially migrated fragments um, which origin um, in the mostly intraforamenal area and then go to the uh, intraspinal area or um, you see here the rim where the uh, neurostructure lies in the bone of the um, L4 vertebra. So this is the technique for extraframial, lateral extraframial uh, approach. So we have, when we are talking about the transfer approach, restrictions. Especially when we are working in the higher lumbar levels, we cannot perform a lateral approach because we have the abdominal structures and retroperitoneal structures which may come in our way. So above the level of L3-4, we have to be careful. We cannot perform uh, uh, such a lateral approach. But even in the lower lumbar levels, we have restrictions. We have restrictions for mobility. You know that the neuroframing becomes smaller and smaller um, in the caudal parts of the lumbar spine. Due to that fact, we have a limitation for uh, mobility. We have a limitation for sequestration. As you see in the, in the picture in the middle, the lines for sequestration. The sequestration should not be um, overgoing these lines. That means the beginning of the pedicle of the overlying vertebra, the middle of the pedicle of the underlying vertebra. The next thing that we always have to look for is the iliac crest. And that means, especially in the le um, level of 5 is 1, the iliac crest is too high to perform a lateral approach. So we have to do then again a posterior lateral approach, and that means our working area changes again. Um, So um, when we want to perform a lateral approach in the higher lumbar levels um, and we are not able to see the anatomical structures around the spine in our preoperative imaging, we ask our radiologist to take a just single slide CT scan of the level that we want to operate but with all um, organs around that, that we can see the skin and in this uh, patients or in these patients we can do um, and can plan um, how far lateral we can work without getting in trouble um, with the retroperitoneal organs. So we have clearly limitations for mobility and as I told you we have limitations for sequestration. On the picture on the left side you see the um, sequestration is beyond the lines that we defined, middle of the pedicle of the underlying vertebra. So you may be lucky to get it out if it's one piece. But in most of the cases you get the amount uh, inside the indication criteria out and you see the rest of the um, material lying uh, very well inside the spinal canal and you're not able to get it out then you have to do special things like resecting uh, parts of the uh, pedicle to get it out. Um, then the operation becomes more and more uh, difficult. So whenever you start these operations, make sure that your herniation is not overgoing these um, mobility and indication lines. The iliac crest is the problem, as I told you, that um, the iliac crest forbids you to choose a uh, lateral approach, especially for the level L5 as 1. So you choose, have to choose um, a posterior lateral approach and your working area changes uh, again from the ventral aptitude space to the disc. So we have an algorithm for lumbar disc herniations, all intra and extraframal herniations are done with a lateral um, approach. All intraspinal located herniations, when they are fitting to the indication criteria concerning the sequestration and the iliac crest are done with a, a lateral transframer approach. But these are only about 30% uh, of the patients um, that can be operated with this approach. And that was the reason for us to search for other uh, possibilities um, because 30% um, is not a good option and then to start to resect bone and parts of the pedicle and to get more access with the transframer approach was not our solution. Our solution was to search for another approach um, to um, get these um, sequestrations out uh, without violating the anatomy of the patients. 
That was the starting point to work through the very well-known interlaminar window. Uh, so that's the same what we are doing in conventional operation. We are passing the flavum ligament, we medialize the neurostructure, we can use our bevel operation cannula as our second instrument by rotating it and medializing the neurostructures. We um, prevent the, uh, the neurostructures um, in front of the instruments. So it's a kind of second instrument inside the spinal canal, like a nerve hook, and then we can resect the material. Again, the interlaminar view is completely different um, to that, what we know from conventional operation because first of all we are working with a 25 degree optical system and the second thing is um, by rotation of the endoscope we can look in every corner of the spinal canal and the big difference to an open surgery is that we don't have to create an approach to look through this approach to look at the structures inside the patient but our eye is directly at the, uh, at the tip of the endoscope so we can look very smoothly without creating an approach um, inside the spinal canal. The interlaminar approach itself is um, compared to the transframeal approach for um, a lot of people much more easier. First of all, we start to plan the skin incision um, just in the middle of the interlaminar window. Then we do the skin incision, introduce the dilator, change the serum into lateral position, and then we um, push the beveled operation cannula with the opening to the medial aspect over the dilator. Then we introduce the endoscope, and first we have to prepare the uh, soft tissues until we find the flavum ligament. We do the incision of the flavum ligament medially, we prepare it to the lateral aspect. We have to resect the epidural fat to identify the neurostructures. Then we mobilize the neurostructures. We can use the beveled operation cannula as our second instrument. We can rotate it. We resect the herniation. We check the decompression and close the skin incision. So step by step, Preparation first of the flavum ligament, incision as medial as possible. You can use your instruments backwards and forward. It is very interesting to um, pull the flavum ligament with the tip of the beveled operation cannula tight to the lateral aspect. It makes it much more easier to open the flavum ligament. Then we open the flavum ligament until we find the medial bony edge of the ascending facet. Then we have to resect um, the, that's the tip here of the ascending facet. There we can get easily access to the lateral part of the spinal canal. Then we have to resect the fat tissue to identify clearly the lateral margin of the um, neurostructure. That is very important. So we see here uh, the beginning of the axilla and we see the traversing nerve root. And we have to make sure that we have enough space here lateral of the neurostructure in this case of the s1 nerve root we can use the um, dissector to get access to the spinal canal with our cannula we rotate the cannula so the neurostructures are be uh, behind the tip of the um, instrument and then we start to resect the herniation and uh, if necessary um, start to work in the disc, do anterior decompression um, if necessary. So our philosophy is always whenever we get access to the disc we try to um, resect all kinds of loose and fragments. When the disc is closed we only do a sequestrectomy. And you see again the free, free floating structures here after decompression. Another example, L45 on the right side, that means right side is cranial, left side is caudal. Again, opening of the flavum ligament and then preparation from medial to lateral. In this case, we see those white things here in the epidural space. These are steroids after epidural injection. 
And then we see in this case uh, the traversing L5 nerve roots and the lateral margin of the dura sac. We have no possibility in this uh, disconnection which is lying in the axilla to luxate the uh, L5 nerve root over the herniated material. So we have to um, first resect the disconnection from the axilla portion and then we have enough uh, space to rotate to, uh, the cannula going into the spinal canal and uh, medializing the new structure, find that defect in the um, disc space and here we see the decompressed new structures. In higher lumbar levels, of course, the interlaminar window may be smaller. So that was the starting point for us to work with um, shavers and drills to resect bone, um, to do this uh, even in higher lumbar levels where we have um, a small interlaminar window. We have different tools like these punctures uh, where, where, where we can use uh, and work in the recess to get access to the lateral margin of the neural structure and you know especially in the higher lumbar levels um, the size of the dura sac um, is much larger um, or at least the um, lateral margin of the dura sac is much more to the lateral aspect um, of the spinal canal and then in this case uh, l34 on the right side cordly migrated we rotate the cannula to the caudal aspect and endoscope to the caudal aspect and um, take out the herniation. Here you see the disc space. In this case, we are not opening the disc space. We have just resected the herniation. The mobility for um, the interlaminar approach is not comparable to the transfemoral one. So we are using the whole system only in soft tissue. That means uh, by using um, drills, and possibility to resect bone, we have no restrictions um, for mobility to the cranial or caudal aspect of this approach. So coming back to the algorithm of uh, lumbar disc donations, we can say about 30% um, can be done um, with the lateral transfermer or exoframer approach and 70%, which is the um, most um, percentage uh, is done with the um, interlaminar approach for the interspinal located herniations. Of course, with this interlaminar approach, we have an extended spectrum, but we cannot work extraspinally. So we need that uh, transframe and exoframer approach for all extraspinal located pathologies, but whenever we can use it due to the indication criteria, as I told you, um, for intraspinal located um, disconnection, we try to use the lateral transfermer approach because we think it's the less traumatic appro um, approach and it's the approach of first choice for um, disconnection whenever it is possible. After dealing with disconnections and having the possibility to resect bone in a sufficient way, the next step in our development was then um, the possibility to deal with spinal stenosis. And when we look at the population development in most of the industrialized countries, we see that there's a change uh, in the population pyramid. Uh, that means people, and, uh, people are getting older and older, and we also know that the mobility of uh, spinal stenosis increases respectively. When we are talking about spinal decompression in a case of uh, uh, spinal stenosis, there was a big change again in the uh, spine surgery in the last decades, from aggressive laminectomy to more selective techniques like undercutting techniques. And when we look at the literature, we see that decompression proves neurogenic claudication, neurological deficits. What we don't know exactly until now is how much do we have to decompress, and when is an additional fusion necessary? When we are talking about um, spinal stenosis, we know that uh, the spinal stenosis origins from different anatomical structures. We divide the spinal stenosis into a central um, stenosis and to a lateral stenosis. Or 
recess or for amyl stenosis. And uh, we also know that we are mainly talking about radicular problems or urogenic claudication, which is the indication for a decompression. And again, back pain is mostly due to secondary phenomena and we cannot promise the patient how much influence will our operation uh, be on this topic. So the question was, starting with spinal stenosis, which approach should we choose for this spinal stenosis, which is the best to do a sufficient decompression for spinal stenosis. And you see already that the interlaminar approach is uh, the one in uh, this red area. So the interlaminar approach uh, is clearly the um, approach of first choice. Let's first have a closer look to the lateral stenosis. We can either have recess stenosis um, or we can have foramenal stenosis. Sometimes we even have uh, joint, uh, dead joint cysts, which may lie into the foramenal area, which are quite rare. But again, we are talking mainly about radicular symptoms. The interlaminar technique is a very standardized technique to do a decompression of your ipsilateral recess. First thing is you find the joint partners, the tip of the descending facet and the um, ascending facet below that. That's the starting point where we start with bone resection. We start to resect the medial portion of the descending facet until we find the medial portion of the ascending facet. We have to resect as much bone that we find the complete ascending facet until we see the tip of the ascending facet. Then we do the resection of the flavum ligament and um, do the decompression in the uh, lateral recess. That is for recess or central stenosis with unilateral radicular symptoms. Here just the um, yeah, the way how we do the bone resection. First of all, we see here the capsula of the descending facet. So that's the bone here of the descending facet. Then we have to find the tip of the descending facet. The flavum ligament stays intact. It's a kind of protection layer in front of our instruments. So there we see already um, the tip of the descending facet and also the um, cartilage of the ascending facet. Um, it is useful to cut into the superficial layer of the flavum ligament which inserts in the capsula of the joint and then we start with bone resection from caudal to cranial, resecting the medial portion of the descending facet. That's the junction to the cranial lamina already. By the way, there are no limitations. Yeah. Um, that's the tip of the ascending facet. That's the flavum ligament. Flavum, flavum ligament is intact until now. Then we have to prepare the flavum ligament. Sometimes you can easily resect the superficial layer of the flavum ligament with a punch. And then um, we open the um, spinal canal first after resecting the medial portion of the ascending facet and especially cord lamina. It's not necessary to resect it completely, but you can thin the bone. Later on, you just resect that thinned bone with a punch. So now we thin the medial portion of the ascending facet and the cord um, lamina. And the flavon ligament is until now intact. So, step by step, um, now we open the flavum ligament, like in the discrenation, um, opening medial, but we are not only cutting a line into the flavum ligament, but we are resecting it completely to the cranial caudal aspect. And then um, here we are at the junction, that's the tip here of the ascending um, facet. And now we are working with a punch and resect the um, thinned bone of the medial portion of the ascending facet and caudal lamina. The amount of decompression is always, of 
course defined by the preoperative imaging. So you always have to make clear and sure that your decompression um, intraoperatively controlled by radiographic control is as much as you see in the pre MRI. And of course you have to uh, control additionally the anterior aspect. In most of the cases you have an anterior compression additionally, bulged annulus, discrimination, osteophytes, whatever. So when you see that the um, neural structures are not moving completely free after your bony work and uh, only recess decompression, you have to do an anterior decompression additionally. Another, another example, uh, L34 on the right side. Tip of the descending facet, starting point for our bone resection. Here it's the junction to the cranial lamina. And when the bone is very thick, resect the bone step by step from uh, yeah, posterior to anterior. That's the tip here of the um, ascending facet resection and thin of the bone of the um, ascending facet caudal lamina. So it's a very standardized uh, technique. Opening of the flavum ligament, resection not only to the lateral aspect but additionally to the caudal and cranial aspect. Then we find the neural structure, find the lateral margin of the neural structure. Yeah, you see this additional material in the recess, soft tissue from the flavum ligaments, bony structures. And then we again see that the structures are not completely free, so we have to take care for the anterior surface here, bulged annulus. Use the um, beveled operation cannula as your second instrument. Resect the material. You can resect osteophytes either with manual drills or with automatic drills. And the uh, ending point should always be uh, free neural structures. So how much do we have to decompress? Of course we have to do this according to the preoperative imaging. So always look at the um, preoperative imaging. How far do I have to decompress? And um, can I follow that um, during the uh, radiographic control during the operation? But a good uh, thing what you should at least uh, be able to decompress is the um, area from the apex of the um, ascending facet um, to the middle um, of um, the pedicle. Um, so that's a good uh, advice for a recess uh, decompression. What is with uh, yeah, a recess stenosis and transfer animal technique? Um, first of all, we have, we see limited indications in recess stenosis. Um, First thing is the approach has to be as lateral as possible. When you see at the left picture, even with the lateral approach, when you resect the interior surface of the ascending facet, you may destroy parts of the joint. When you consider, when you do this with a posterior lateral approach, you resect much more bone to get access to the medial portion of the ascending facet. And that's the structure which causes the problem in a recess stenosis. The next thing is it is very difficult to decompress anteriorly um, with a transfer approach. It is easy to resect material on this level, but especially when you have bulge annulus osteophytes, which are a cranial caudal of the disc space, it is not possible to do this with a lateral or with a transfer uh, approach. And we only have rare cases of that joint cyst uh, that are located in this uh, frame and area. So the question is always what I'm doing in foraminal stenosis. The goals of operation is always the decompression. Um, and I always have to ask myself, where do I have uh, the compression? Where do I have to decompress? Is it intra um, spinally or extra spinally? Is it enough to decompress or do I have to reconstruct or realign the spine? 
So the mechanical possibilities with transframer techniques, in our opinion, are absolutely restricted, especially for those people who are talking about foraminoplasty. Um, the question is always, what do I want to reach? What is the pathology that causes um, the radicular pain. And there's one indication that is the uh, so-called SAP impingement. That means those patients um, by uh, retroflexion of the um, lumbar spine, the apex of the SNE facet impinges the um, exiting nerve root. But for these cases, we have to resect not bone in the caudal part of the foramen or lateral part of the foramen. Um, this is not that problem. We have really to identify the exiting nerve root and we have to resect the tip of the SAP. Um, but these are quite rare cases. When we want to do that, we have to choose again an extra foraminal approach because in those cases of foraminal stenosis, very narrow conditions, we cannot push our big instruments in a very narrow foramen and hope that the exiting nerve root will survive. So we have to plan the approach extraframally at the uh, junction of the pedicle and ascending facet, and then on a continuous visualization, we prepare everything. So this is uh, one of the rare cases uh, with an SAP impingement, combined additionally with a recess stenosis on this level, this is an open preoperated patient uh, intraspinally. Here you see the tip of the SAP and you see the exiting nerve root at 3 o'clock. So first we start with this tip control burr, that means actively flexible burr to resect uh, the anterior surface of the SAP. So this is only access work, this has nothing to do with foraminoplasty. We are working here in the caudal part of the foramen to get access to the medial portion of the ascending facet and the tip of the SAP. So again, this is the tip of the SAP. That's the area which impinges in retroflexion. So now we have to resect this part after um, doing first of all this excess bone work with a punch. Now we see that's the area where the tip of the SAP was. And then now we are working again in the caudal part of the foramen um, due to uh, the decompression of the recess. But you can imagine that you only can do the decompression on this level. And in most of the cases, this is not enough. This is a lateral margin here of the uh, neurostructures. That's the junction to the caudal pedicle. Um, so quite rare uh, patients who have these symptoms. So that's here the anterior surface of the spinal canal. You see the neurostructure, that's the um, exiting uh, four nerve root decompressed lateral recess on disc level. Again, a quite rare situation. So the next step was then to talk about central stenosis. Of course, we knew, especially uh, in those patients, we have to do a lot of bone resection. And there's no possibility to do this with a transframeal technique. There's no indication for indirect decompression. And again, we are talking about predominantly neurogenic claudication. So you have the possibility to deal with the center stenosis with bilateral symptoms, especially claudication, um, like we knew that um, from open surgery with an over-the-top decompression. That means after decompression of your ipsilateral recess, you go with a complete endoscope to the interspinous area, find the flavum ligament of the opposite side, resect the flavum ligament of the opposite side, um, do the decompression in the uh, contralateral, de um, uh, contralateral recess. Um, so that is very near um, to what we know um, with the over-top technique from the microscope. Uh, example for that, first of all, we do bone resection, um, of course, like we did that um, in the recess stenosis, that means medial portion of the um, descending facet, cranial lamina, 
medial portion of the ascending facet, cord lamina, and the flavum ligament stays intact as long as possible. You have the possibility to use a bigger scope um, to do this in a time sparing manner. And uh, then you go to the um, resect the flavum ligament, of course, completely, uh, not only from medial to lateral, but also from cranial to caudal. And um, after uh, doing that, you go to the uh, flavum ligament of the opposite side. Um, and step by step, you resect the flavum ligament of the opposite side. Um, when you work with the punch um, at the opposite side, be careful that you don't uh, squeeze and uh, cut into the um, dura. Make sure that your beveled operation cannula is not compressing the dura when you're going to the opposite side. Now we look in the joint of the um, opposite facet um, and then we do the decompression of the contralateral recess. So resection here of um, the um, soft tissue and bony structures of the contralateral recess. Now that is our ipsilateral side and uh, then we see the contralateral decompression and beginning of the traversing nerve root of the contralateral side. That's the lateral margin here and beginning of the traversing nerve root of the contralateral side. Again, an example, L45 on the left side. So first, ipsilateral decompression, medial portion of the descending facet, cranial lamina, and then uh, medial portion of the ascending facet and cord lamina, De bony decompression. And you see the instruments when you use the um, stenosis system are comparable to that what we see in open um, surgery. Resection of the ipsilateral uh, bony structures in the recess, decompression of our ipsilateral side is done. And then um, we go to the interspinous area. Sometimes it is necessary to resect bone here or so to get access to make sure that you have enough space, that's the joint of the opposite side, that you have enough space um, to overgo the dura sac that you absolutely avoid to um, squeeze the dura sac with your operation cannula. Again, the lateral margin here of the um, opposite side of the traversing nerve root. So for these uh, lumbar stenosis, we also have a uh, algorithm. For all lateral stenosis uh, with foraminal stenosis, I mean, especially the, the rare cases of that joint stenosis, we have um, a transframer approach. For very rare cases of recess stenosis located on disc levels and for SAP impingement, we have the transframer approach, but these are limited possibilities. For all other indications, lateral stenosis and central stenosis, the interlamina approach um, is the approach of first choice. And uh, of course, we have to respect when we are working transfermally, um, like we have seen that for discrimination, the limitations for the transfermial approach. And for the interlamina approach, we have an algorithm. That means recess stenosis or central stenosis with unilateral symptoms are done with an ipsilateral approach and unilateral decompression. Central stenosis with bilateral symptoms of claudication are done with an ipsilateral approach with an over-the-top decompression. But whenever we have a stenosis with anterior compression on the opposite side and bilateral radicular symptoms, we do a bilateral approach. You can do this uh, with one skin incision just in the midline and uh, push the skin a little bit to um, your ipsilateral and then contralateral side and do a unilateral decompression on both sides. So after development of these techniques for decompression of the lumbar spine, the big uh, question is of course, do we have advantages compared to the uh, conventional operations? There's no doubt we have reduced traumatization, not only due to the small skin incision, but especially due to the um, 
restricted or um, yeah, less um, deep traumatization of the soft tissues. We are working on a continuous irrigation, which makes a very good visualization. We are working with a 25 degree optical system. That means we can look in uh, every corner of the spinal canal, our eyes directly in front of the instrument. When we look at the data um, of studies, um, there are a lot of uh, different techniques on the market for minimal invasive decompressions. When we now look at the yeah, reviews and uh, more and more data are coming uh, every year, um, we can say um, that it's stated that it is significantly more safe. It is as effective as uh, um, conventional operation, but we have additional benefits with these endoscopic procedures. We have discussed our own scientific work in a lot of big congresses, uh, especially with evidence-based medicine sessions. And uh, one key point is uh, we can promise that we can um, achieve the same results like uh, in the standard procedure and that should be a precondition when you introduce new techniques. But we have all advantages of the full endoscopic um, technique on side of the patient, the surgeon and economy. So we see it as a sufficient and very effective alternative in the field of uh, spinal um, decompression. So why should I offer my patients an endoscopic technique? First, I can promise uh, I can uh, um, achieve good clinical results. With this endoscope, you have a fast operation and setup time, especially for disconnection. Incision to incision time in our hospital is uh, normally not more than 60 minutes. We have technical improvements, uh, good visualizations, uh, light condition. Bleeding is never a problem for the patient, it's a problem for your visualization, but you can solve that problem easily. Obesity is never a problem. Um, you don't have to create an approach where you have to look through. Uh, complication rate is uh, really absolutely rare. Discitis or wound healing problems are um, nearly not seen. Um, in our opinion, uh, revisions are facilitated and we do all our uh, revisions also after conventional operations endoscopically. We have a reduced traumatization um, and we have a high patient acceptance. And there are more and more uh, studies about the learning curve. Of course, there is a learning curve, but the learning curve is not more than uh, from other um, new techniques like laparoscopic, appendectomy or whatever. So, um, it, of course, there's a little bit more individually, but everyone who has experienced either in conventional spine surgery or endoscopic procedures um, on the brain or uh, on the joint has advantages uh, um, for the first steps. So until now the microscopic assisted surgery is the standard um, but um, the uh, full endoscopic decompression um, is growing. Um, we have a worldwide growth and currently um, a market share from more than 18% and when you ask economists about uh, things like that, they say when you overgo 15%, the technique will evolve by itself. Um, so these are quite promising things and maybe, uh, yeah, the things are changing in the last, in the next 10 years. So what are the future of endoscopy? Um, first of all, we have technical developments, uh, modified endoscopes, chip on the tip, uh, technique, uh, LED, wireless uh, things, uh, new instruments, bone resection, robotic and navigation, everything is possible. Um, further distribution and decompression, that means not only, uh, of course, m now mainly in herniation and stenosis, but also in tumors, uh, tumor phototherapy, um, the um, big yeah, hope at the beginning to establish the endoscope uh, for fusion is at least uh, at uh, this moment not so convincing. Um, and um, of course, we think that 
um, the full-on scarpa techniques will establish uh, will be established in spine surgery as an alternative to microscopic assisted uh, techniques. And when we look uh, worldwide, uh, uh, not only in our workshops but also um, to the published papers and uh, the int um, increasing interest uh, in endoscopic techniques, we see worldwide increasing surgeon using these full endoscopic techniques. We see increasing scientific works. And especially we see those new generation of young spine surgeons that are already growing up with these techniques and use them in their daily practice, especially in the Asian countries and in the United States. But at the end, I always have to emphasize, we need conventional operations. We need conventional approaches. We need them for the patient. We need them for our education. Because um, we are not at a point that we can offer our patient for all pathology and endoscopic treatment. So we have to fit the treatment and the approach to the pathology of the patient. And of course, we need open surgery um, to deal with complications, especially at the learning curve, um, like a duratea, when you're not able to uh, suture that endoscopically, which is possible afterwards when you get uh, over the, or got over the learning curve, um, then you have no possibility to open the patient to do a conventional approach and to suture the duratea if it's big enough. So, Thank you for your interest and bye-bye. Um, um, hello everyone from the old phase of River Spine uh, and uh, thank you Dr. Komp uh, for this nice presentation. Uh, I will do the, uh, the moderation for the questions and uh, Dr. Komp will answer the questions and also uh, I will try to uh, mo uh, answer. Uh, let's start with the first question uh, from Yoza name. Mm -hmm. Dr. Komp, many schools of endoscopic surgery are still doing the posterolateral approach despite of the advantages of doing the lateral transformal approach. What do you think, uh, what is the reason for this? So, do, do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, it's a kind of history reason. Uh, the postural lever approach was uh, the first approach that was chosen to the um, lumbar spine. And um, of course, uh, people had also success with this approach. This is not the point, but uh, the reason why um, people um, changed the approach and um, more and more younger people are now using other approaches, especially interlaminar approaches and the lateral transfer approach, shows that we have to be open-minded um, to all these uh, very uh, paradigmas, um, everything works uh, with one approach. I think we have a good weapon, this is the endoscope, and we have different options to use that. <laughs> Um, it is our personal thing, is our personal development. Um, I think that the, tra uh, the lateral transfermer approach has a lot of uh, advantages um, in comparison to the postural lateral approach. Uh, but until now, surgeons are using the postural lateral approach and uh, they um, treat patients with that. And um, everyone has to decide what is his favorite thing for us. It is the lateral transframer approach, definitely, as, as I uh, pointed out in the lecture. Um, but everyone has to decide that by um, himself, I think. Okay, thank you, Dr. Komp. Uh, uh, next question. Um, okay, uh, from Eric Momen. Uh, for patients with recessed stenosis and disc protrusion, can you start with stenosis scope and switch to interlaminar scope? Will switching to smaller scope cause irrigation pressure to be lost? Um, yes, uh, this is a very good uh, question or remark. Um, the big scope um, is a very good uh, tool to resect bone in a sufficient uh, and fast way. Uh, but 
always when you're working inside the spinal canal, when you need um, the uh, bevel operation cannula to retract the new structures, you shouldn't do that with a big scope um, and the big um, cannula because it's just too big and you have a risk then to damage the newer structures. So in these cases, we uh, really uh, change the scope, but we also change the cannula. Don't work with a small endoscope in the big um, cannula because then you really have the problem that your irrigation uh, and pressure is not correct. Yeah, when you change the scope, when you want to work inside the spinal canal after finishing the bone resection with a big scope, then change also um, the, um, the, the cannula and uh, use the normal endoscope to work uh, further on in the spinal canal. And uh, I would like to comment on this topic also. Uh, if you are working with the flow control pumps, if you change the scope, uh, the bigger scope to the smaller scope, then you have to calibrate the system again. Uh, don't uh, forget to do it. You have probably you have to change the old uh, uh, irrigation tube and start the pump again and uh, cal calibrate the uh, scope according to the new. Uh, resistance uh, because uh, the flow control pumps uh, has to know the resistance of the scope be uh, before starting the irrigation and uh, I, I guess I skip one question uh, here uh, what about uh, the bipolar biportal technique please Dr. Kong well, um, the bipolar technique is, uh, to our mind, uh, again, a yeah, kind of uh, development in between the normal uniportal um, open technique and um, the endoscopic technique. Um, the, um, I think the, the, the big uh, advantage is um, that you um, have not so much soft tissue damage and that you have really good intraoperative viewing and that you can use uh, your uh, normal um, instruments that you are used to. Um, but I also think that um, compared to a uniportal uh, situation, um, the um, whole thing is a little bit more uh, or not so minimal invasive like with the uniportal system. Um, but I think also one, the, the most important thing is um, when you have one method, uh, either microscopic assisted um, uh, or bipodal or uh, endoscopic, full endoscopic technique, the most important thing is that you really are uh, doing this operation on a, a good level, that you are over the learning curve and um, then uh, I think uh, every technique um, is okay because the most important goal is to uh, yeah to help the patient. Um, thank you, Dr. Comp, and also I would like to comment. Um, uh, for me, uh, still the irrigation uh, and the outflow uh, during the bipolar technique is not clear. Uh, we, we inflow a lot of uh, uh, saline inside the spine, but uh, it's not clear to get uh, how to get out flow. Uh, this has to be uh, so. And the next question: um, uh, What are what are you for drill types for interlaminar decompression? Sorry, I did, didn't get the question right. I think uh, the question is: What is your favorite drill types for interlaminar decompression, uh, as wow. I understood from the from the yeah. Question. Um, so in most of the cases I use for the first uh, kind of drill, the one-sided uh, uh, drill, um, and uh, especially for the media portion of the ascending facade and the cordial lamina, um, I like to use the uh, round uh, drill, not the diamond drill, um, because uh, it's much fa faster to uh, resect bone with a, a round drill. Um, and uh, just for finishing very uh, small uh, things and very near to uh, soft tissue, I use the dry diamond drill. Thank you. And uh, an another question, how do you prefer to control bone bleeding? 
Yeah, there are different options what you can do. First, first of all, of course, uh, look uh, for the positioning, look for the uh, blood pressure of the patient. These are general things. Um, the other thing is um, when you open uh, blood vessels um, inside the um, sponges bone, um, first you should try to coagulate them just with the radio frequency. Um, this is often enough. If that is not enough, um, you either can use the diamond drill just to close uh, um, the vessel, like you know that from open surgery, or another possibility is to use the um, um, the punch, uh, the kerosene, um, and just squeeze this um, the uh, spongious bone and close the um, uh, the vessel by that. Um. Dr. Comp, I would like to ask uh, you at that uh, point, uh, do you have any experience with the bone wax, the, with the endoscopic technique? No, we don't use bone wax uh, during the operations. The only thing what we are using uh, is uh, gelita, like uh, collagenous foam or something like that, but especially inside the spinal canal, not uh, at the bone. Uh, we don't have any experience with with bone wax, um, yeah, I, I think technically this uh, shouldn't be that big problem. Um, sometimes, of course, uh, it may be, I, I can think about uh, rests of bone wax, which may be then in the way and you have to clean the optical system, etc. But if you really have a bleeding, this which can, cannot be stopped, um, maybe this could be a solution too, yeah. Okay. Thank you. The next question, do you see lower infection rates in endoscopic procedure? Uh, we are doing about 1,500 endoscopic procedures a year and I cannot remember uh, an infection um, of a primarily operation. Of course, we get patients uh, that have been operated uh, several weeks, several months ago open, in open surgery. Uh, there, of course, you have uh, a higher risk, but uh, infections are really an absolutely rare complication, especially when you look at the worldwide papers. Uh, this is really a very rare complication. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, which anesthesia do you use? If the patient has a problems in breathing in these approaches, local anesthesia or general anesthesia? As we started, well, when we started with these operations 20 years ago, everyone was doing these on the uh, local anesthesia. And we started uh, these operations on a local anesthesia too, but uh, we, um, yeah, f we found that it is um, very uncomfortable, not only for the patient um, who's lying on the table and uh, yeah, um, and it's also uncomfortable for you. Um, so we uh, started to work uh, the first uh, operation on the general anesthesia and since these times we are doing all of our operation, um, that means transfer and interlaminal ones under um, general anesthesia. And uh, we have never had a problem um, with that, but of course I know that people are working uh, under local anesthesia and uh, this is technical, uh, absolutely um, feasible, yeah. So. Um, I think everyone has to decide this by himself, but uh, for us, uh, we are doing all of our operations under general anesthesia. Okay, thank you. Another question. Uh, I have problems with increased bleeding while working with a stenosis endoscope compared to a usual endoscope. Is this normal? Well, um, of course, when you're working with a bigger scope and you're rejecting a lot of bone, you have uh, or may have uh, higher um, yeah, uh, rejection area of bone. And uh, as I told you, when you open the little vessels in the spongious bone, uh, you may have more bleeding. So um, I always give the advice not only at the lumbar spine, especially for stenosis, but also at the cervical spine. Don't uh, go on with the operation. If you have a bad visualization due to the bleeding, try to find the vessel and try to stop the bleeding. 
When you open two or three vessels, the visualization is getting worse. If you go further on with your operation, you open the next two or three vessels and you're, uh, you, you will never find the first one. So always try to stop the bleeding as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, what do you think about bipolar endoscopic spine surgery that widespread in Asia? I think we, we had this uh, answer from your side. And the next qu question, uh, what are chances of dural tear when going to contralateral side, how to avoid it? Yeah, um, that's a very important topic. Um, the first thing is um, not only a dura tear, but dura damage or neuro damage. Um, a lot of people who start with this technique to go over the top are only focused on uh, the area in front of them. So they are lucky to get to the opposite side, but uh, they are not taking care for the cannula. Always make sure that the cannula is not pushing the dura to the anterior surface. That's the first thing. The next thing to avoid damaging, as we started with that, we um, uh, especially when we resected uh, the soft tissue and um, bony uh, structures in the uh, and the contralateral recess, you have when you go in with a kerosen and you're not able to see clearly what you're working at, <coughs> um, then you have a higher risk um, to um, wrinkle the dura uh, or to have a dura tear there. So uh, we are now going more and more um, just to the resect the flavum ligament with a, um, with a scissor. And then if you see um, you resected the flavum ligament and you see that there are some uh, bony things to do, uh, then you can easier use the, um, use the punch. Um, that is just my advice to that. Okay, uh, the next question, more details, something about fluid irrigation? Um, some details about what? Irrigation? Fluid irrigation. Fluid irrigation? We have irrigation system. You're just the irrigation system, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in former times we used just uh, gravity for our uh, operation. That means we uh, have very high ceilings in our ORs. Um, but now we are very thankful about the irrigation pressure control system, which is delivered by River Spine because uh, the, it promises you and makes sure that the irrigation pressure is never in a critical area um, and uh, it adapts to the uh, endoscope that you use. So this is very comfortable for, for, the, for the doctor because he is not uh, doing anything yeah, which could be uh, negative for the patient. The other thing is we always work with open portals. That means we are never closing um, the, um, yeah, uh, the, the main portal. Um, that's the working channel. Um, so always work with open portals, even when you're not working with a pump, um, that's my advice, always work with open portals, don't close anything from the endoscope or from the outflow, and um, yeah, but uh, again, the, uh, the pump is uh, really helpful. And uh, addition to your uh, comment, um, the system is open system, yeah, uh, for, uh, we are working with a round shaped sleeve. Uh, but we are working with the uh, elliptic shape uh, endoscope. Uh, by this way, you have always more chance to get outflow between the uh, scope and the uh, sleeve. Uh, it's very important. Uh, uh, and also, the, as Dr. Comp uh, explained, we are working with the flow control pumps, not the arthro, arthro pumps. The flow control pumps means that you, when you calibrate the system, the optic with the pump, uh, then the pump recognizes the resistance immediately and never allows the pressure rise up than theoretically 50 mm Hg, but in the practical practice we don't see more than 35 mm Hg. Uh, and then the next question, uh, complications in your hands, what are the most uh, frequent complications Dr. Comp you faced? Difficult to say. I would uh, say the most, yeah, the, the, the most frequent complications uh, are 
maybe um, that I think especially at the beginning when you start with this procedure um, that you are not taking care enough uh, to uh, identify the lateral margin of the structure. First, the structure, first neural structure that you see, that means uh, uh, if you're working in a, a lower lumbar levels, sometimes the surgeon think they are working lateral of the traversing nerve, but in fact they are working in the axilla, so they have a higher risk to damage any neural structure. Um, the next thing is when you found really the traversing nerve root before you mobilize the structures, especially by pushing in the cannula and rotating the cannula, release the anterior adhesions, try to find the beginning of the herniation because otherwise you have a risk that you squeeze the whole herniation um, to the medial caudal or whatever aspect and then you are not able to find it, especially as a beginner. Um, I think um, dura tears, um, when you are working really uh, concentrated, um, a small dura tear by cutting, for example, the flavum ligament at the beginning is not that problem. Um, a bigger dura tear, um, as I told you in the lecture, uh, especially at the beginning, should be um, open and uh, sutured. Um, and just one advice to avoid complications at the beginning. Um, we always told our patient when you are uh, when you have started with these operations, always tell the patient, well, we are doing this endoscopically. We will try this to do this completely endoscopically. But whenever we have a problem, whenever we have a complication or whatever, we turn over to our normal operation, maybe microscopic cystic or conventional open or whatever. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Komp. Uh, next question. How can avoid exiting nerve root damaging during a transfer endoscopic discectomy? Yeah, that's a very important question. Um, the first thing is um, look at the preoperative imaging. If you have a preoperative imaging which is uh, quite actual, um, look that you can identify the uh, exiting nerve root in the transversal and sagittal slide. Um, if you're not able to identify it clearly, look at the opposite side. Is the um, exiting nerve root really leaving the foramen in the cranial part? Um, we tried a lot of things, um, neuro monitoring, etc., etc. Um, we just have one simple thing uh, done during the operation that is, we have our assistant uh, who's palpating the leg of the patient. Uh, so whenever you place the needle or insert the dilator, whatever, if there's a motoric reaction, you should stop and redirect your instruments or you directly do an extra frame approach. Especially for those patients where we are not able to identify clearly the anatomical things inside uh, the foramen, we do an extra frame approach. That means uh, we are staying outside of the foramen and um, then we have uh, no chance to um, damage the exiting nerve root. The problem is, of course, um, especially for the beginner, that this approach is demanding because you have to control with the left hand the complete scope. Thank you, Dr. Komp. And next question. Multi-level in single transformal incision possible? If so, how many level? Multi-level operation, first of all, um, we try to avoid multi-level operation because um, most of our patients, when it is possible, um, have been here in the hospital for interventional pain therapy. That means we try to figure out what is really the most affected level and we then tell the patient what can he expect or um, she expect from the operation. Multi-level operation from transframeal with one uh, approach is, in my opinion, not possible because the trajectory of your approach um, is never the best for uh, um, for more than one level. Yeah, so you have the trajectory for your uh, um, approach um, for for this level. If you're working then to the cranial aspect, you have a higher risk to uh, to damage the exiting nerve root. So in transfemoral uh, situations. Uh, I would always uh, use one approach um, for um, for one level. 
but I cannot remember one situation that we operated more than one level transframing. And the next question. Are you doing interlaminar approach for thoracic and cervical stenosis when patient has spinal cord compression myelopathy? Yeah, it depends a little bit uh, what uh, you really have. Of course, you can do either interlaminar, uh, for example, uh, thoracic uh, spine, very rare uh, um, pathologies. You can either do a, a normal dorsal decompression like an interlaminar uh, approach. Uh, or you do a, a transfranal um, approach. Of course, uh, due to the ribs, uh, your trajectory is again uh, posterior lateral and you have to resect bone then to get access to the spinal canal. Another uh, possibility, if you have, for example, a thoracic myelopathy due to a, a giant disc herniation or whatever, uh, then we uh, choose a, uh, a transthoracic approach. And uh, we do a kind of uh, box shape technique to resect that, uh, but these are quite rare cases, of course, to resect. Cervical spine, um, you can resect, of course, do a dorsal decompression, uh, for example, for abscesses or cysts, which create uh, a, a myelopathy. But if you really have a myelopathy, in most of the cases, the problem comes from the anterior part and uh, then we address this pathology from the anterior part and if you have a myelopathy for us this is not an indication from anterior for an endoscopic procedure thank you uh, what are your protocol for dural tear repair any experience with clip uh, for sealing dural tear and how the planning to go for uh, tear repair is taken yeah, first of all, we always say um, try to be as aggressive uh, when you see a duratia as possible. That means if you, uh, for example, during a transfermal approach, you're working in the ventral surface and you're doing a um, um, duratia there, um, I uh, wouldn't first do uh, nothing. Um, the technical uh, possibilities to uh, work on that are absolutely limited and in most of the cases nothing happens. Um, but when we're talking of the posterior operations, if you, for example, cut into the uh, dura while opening the flagrum ligament, the defect is more, normally not more than uh, two millimeters. Um, so we have the possibility either to uh, um, just to wait. Uh, you can put some artificial dura on the defect. Um, of course, you have a little bit of bleeding afterwards. Um, fibrin glue is not really working due to the irrigation. And um, the other thing is, if you have a dura tear, what, what you can see, if it's in a dorsal and lateral part, we uh, suture it endoscopically with a, a 6 O uh, needle and uh, just do this with a, a special notch, uh, push, a knot uh, pusher and, uh, and the rongeur. But this is, uh, especially at the beginning, a little bit demanding. Uh, so if you have a dura tear, for example, uh, where the a nerve is already luxating out of the dura sac. I would say this is an indication uh, to open the patient to uh, suture the uh, dura. Okay. Uh, the next question. When working with a stenotic or endoscope, a large amount of water is consumed. Is it should be? Yeah, that's right. Of course, uh, as more bigger the uh, irrigation uh, channel is as more uh, water you use but uh, again I think this is not not a question of, uh, of practicability uh, and if you're still working with uh, drapes that just leave uh, leave the water uh, dripping on the floor of the OR this is of course not so nice uh, but there are a lot of uh, single use or um, other things uh, uh, on the market where you can collect the water and just um, do the suction uh, in between the operations. So I think it's a question of practicability. Thank you. And what is your recommendation for uh, the surgeons uh, who wants to start this operation? Well, the first thing is uh, when you're really interested to start this uh, operation, uh, the first thing is to uh, 
first see the operation um, and visit, for example, an experienced surgeon in your country or wherever um, you think an experienced surgeon is. Uh, the next thing is uh, then um, to get the first impression um, attending, for example, a workshop. Um, Revel Spine offers different um, education concepts, especially for these um, surgeons who try to uh, or, or who want to start. The most important thing, I think, when you follow these steps, uh, this is very helpful. And um, the most important thing is beside the workshop, the help from the Revo Spine staff for the first operation, that the decision to start with the operation, the decision of education and teaching, and the decision uh, to start with the operation um, should be as short together as possible. And uh, I would like to add something to this point. Uh, also, the successful starting point is uh, important part is selecting the case. Uh, if you start with the difficult case, immediately you will have problem. From our side, to, uh, as a recommendation to, to the surgeons who want to start, but, uh, for the interlaminar approach, definitely start with the L5S1, with the, with the uh, paramedian herniations and for the transformal approach please start with the L4-5 or L4, L3-4 level with the large foramen and especially select the case the disc herniation uh, located on the disc level uh, otherwise uh, if you select the 3-4 level for interlaminar approach then you will have problem uh, with, the, with, the, with the small interlaminar window of course uh, these are the important uh, details also and uh, next question. Some patients have very hypertrophic joints and narrow uh, uh, width of the lamina. Are there any differences in the compression, the compression technique that you use in these cases? No, there are no, um, no um, differences. Of course, you, um, especially in those patients, you, you cannot identify an interlaminar window. Um, but um, you just do your approach. You have to find the, uh, the joint and um, have to go um, to find the tip of the uh, descending facet. And in those cases, of course, the, uh, the osteophytes or the big uh, bone mass is also growing over the flavum ligament. But when you start to resect that bone, um, you find either the landmark of the ascending facet, then you have to uh, go more to the medial aspect to find the first layers of flavum ligament, and then you have your anatomical um, orientation and uh, can um, just resect uh, step by step um, even very high uh, hypertrophic uh, uh, joints. Uh, next question, Dr. Kohn Do you do uh, post operative MRI as a routine? No. Um, in uh, our hospital, and we are a public hospital, um, um, these things uh, are not uh, paid. And uh, the most important thing for us is that the uh, symptomatic of the patient, that the pain is away, and uh, that's uh, our yeah, landmark and orientation that the operation was successful. Okay. Uh, hello, Dr. Birjan from my side. Uh, next question, your guidance for those who are using other posterior systems wants to do a uh, full endoscopy. Mm. Can you say that again? Yeah. W what is your recommendation if they are doing a microscopic endoscopic assisted systems as I understood uh, to, to start for the full endoscopic technique? I think it's the same uh, who, who wants to start. Uh, Dr. Kong? Yeah. Um, if I got the question right, is uh, w w what should we do if we are uh, used to work with an endoscopic assisted, uh, like Gaston or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. and want to do this endoscopically? Um, well, I, I think um, uh, it's, it's the same. Uh, what you used before, uh, either microscope or an endoscopic assisted surgery, the, the, it, it is absolutely different, uh, the full endoscopic uh, um, 
uh, working. Uh, of course, people that are working already uh, with an endoscope uh, have a little bit, uh, yeah, um, have a little bit advantages uh, to learn that. But it is really a new technique, and uh, you have to, yeah, be aware of that and uh, to uh, invest your time. Okay, uh, my comment on this question. Um, I think the endoscopic assisted systems are not a step between the micro and the end full endoscopic technique. Yeah, completely they are different. Yeah, the problem for the surgeons with the full endoscopic technique at the beginning, uh, it's a handling and the handling of the full endoscopic technique is completely different from the endoscopic assisted system. Yeah, and uh, next question: What size dural tear can heal without any intervention? I don't know if there's a yep. certain answer for this. What's your I, experience? I, I don't know. Yeah, sure. I don't know. I think there's no rule. Yeah, I think so. Um, in what kind of cases would you definitely prefer microscopic technique to endoscopic? Um, well, in our patients who are I'm not talking about uh, we are orthopedic surgeons that means we are not working uh, with intradural uh, things though I know that some neurosurgeons are working with the endoscope uh, there too uh, for us for decompression uh, there is no indication for microsurgery anymore we are doing no uh, decompression in a conventional way Okay, uh, next question. Please, could you tell me what cases uh, in a MRI uh, are not candidates to interlaminar approach? Which cases are not fitting to an interlaminar approach? Is that the question? Can you understand it from the MRI, for example? I, I got the question. Yeah. I think that's that's the general question. Uh, should I use a transfer approach or should I choose an interlaminar approach? Of course, every intraframinal and extraframinal herniation is much more demanding to operate with an interlaminar approach. If you want to reach an extraframinal herniation, you have to resect a lot of bone from the facet. Maybe sometimes you have to do a complete facetectomy. This is technically possible, but um, I always say we have the possibility to, to use different approaches to focus on the pathology. And if I have an extra spinal located pathology, my first approach or approach of first choice will be a trans uh, or extra frameal one. If I have an intraspinal located pathology, um, we prefer if it's inside the indication criteria uh, lateral transfer approach but with the interlaminar approach of course all these herniations can be operated thank you uh, what do you think about the endoscopic fusion well i already uh, talked about that a little bit in the lecture um, i think this hype is a little bit going back um, and I think that the technical solutions uh, to clean the end intervertebral space sufficiently uh, that you really can achieve a fusion not to put an implant in that's not a big problem um, but that uh, are problems that are not solved until today so I think uh, right now um, the endoscopic assisted or endoscopic fusion is um, at least not comparable to uh, other situations like uh, yeah um, mini t leaf or a leaf or whatever kind of fusion technique you use yeah and uh, another question approach to intradural tumor uh, you answered this question but I can comment on this uh, I have some very small experience with the in, uh, intradural operations. I had experience with, with a simple tattered cord uh, I did 
uh, three cases uh, to re release the Tetrit court with the full endoscopic technique. Uh, and the next question, uh, I think, how one should plan bone work from cranial laminar or cranial spinal laminar junction and then to contralateral bone work. What do you recommend is to follow the regime of uh, bone uh, work? I'm not sure if I got the question completely right. Uh, as I understood the question, uh, what is your steps to, to do uh, spinal decompression for the stenosis? Well, because uh, first you thing know, there are a lot of discussion to where to start the decompression, uh, as I understood from the question, uh, from spinal laminar junction or uh, from the lamina from the cranial side or caudal side of the level. Uh, could you comment on this? Yeah. Well, we, we always start first on our ipsilateral side, that's the first point. The second point is we always start uh, um, to resect from the tip of the descending facet, that means from caudal, to the cranial aspect uh, and then we follow the media portion of the descending facet resect uh, as much as needed from the cranial lamina then we see the tip of the ascending facet um, resect uh, the media portion of the um, ascending facet and then as much as needed from the um, caudal lamina um, and when we then decompress our ipsilateral side we uh, go if that is necessary to the opposite side. Okay, thank you. And uh, next two questions are similar. I would like to uh, read both. Calcified disc, how do you deal? And interlaminar approach, how many multi-level uh, you have used? And do you recommend obtaining a preoperative CT for, to see if the disc is calcified? And which tools uh, are you using to uh, decompress? Yeah, calcified uh, material is especially uh, in the uh, thoracic spine maybe a problem and should be absolutely um, preoperatively uh, planned with a CT scan. Um, but at the lumbar spine, um, it is not that big problem. Normally, uh, you all already see it in the radiographs uh, that you have a calcification and you see it from the MRI that you expect at least a calcification. If you're not sure, especially at the beginning, um, and the history of the patient is not absolutely clear, I would say good, uh, make, a, make an additional CT scan. But normally we are not doing that um, at, the, at the lumbar spine. When you have uh, a calcified uh, situation, um, you use your instruments that are uh, uh, there. That means you start with uh, the small instruments if that is not enough and you mobilize the um, neurostructure. Um, that is one important thing. You have to at the, um, release the adhesion of the neurostructure um, because otherwise you squeeze the neurostructure against the um, calcified uh, thing and um, you have to really see the calcified material and then you have the possibility to work uh, with the um, um, hand drills, uh, just uh, the manual drills, um, just to resect the uh, calcified material. Or you use uh, the um, the automatic drills uh, like the um, diamond burr. Um, so technically, uh, uh, this is not a problem to resect um, the calcified material. Uh, thank you, Dr. Combe. And the last question uh, for synovial seats there are, that are adherent to the dura in the recess, which endoscopic tools do you use to dissect? Yeah, very important um, remark, uh, because we haven't been talking about the cyst in the, in the lecture. Uh, the cyst can be uh, sometimes very demanding, uh, because first of all, uh, even uh, if the MRI was done three weeks uh, prior to surgery, the cyst can be much more bigger than you expected in the MRI. Um, and one advice that I can give you is always try to start really as medial as possible. When you open the flavum ligament, you should see the opposite flavum ligament um, just in front of you when you open the flavum ligament. Because um, the most important thing is not to open the flavum ligament and to open the cyst because then it is much more demanding to find the anatomical um, structures, but to open the flavum ligament to see the epidural space and to see the beginning of the cyst. 
and then you have to uh, release these adhesions which can be sometimes really hard between the medial surface of the um, um, cysts and the dura and be careful the dura you know that from open surgery is sometimes very thin um, but then take your time step by step um, if it's not possible to release it in the cranial aspect release it in the caudal aspect just one advice always finish your bone work first um, that means um, resect enough bone before you uh, resect soft tissues okay uh, thank you dr comb sharing your experience with us uh, we are end of our webcast and uh, please stay safe in these difficult days and hope to see you in the few, in the uh, next webcast uh, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much.